Hi everybody. Um, what I'm going to be showing you today is what in was is, is a small part of the research that I did that in another life would have been um, part of a master's thesis in geoscience. But uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, science and a little bit about um, not so much technology. I know it's a tech conference, but, but a little bit about science and a little bit of math and some a little little bit of electronics. So. I'm going to talk about predicting natural background radiation uh, using the Nebraska Sandhills, primarily using uh, aerial gamma ray surveys. So this project all got started um, as a result of the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant meltdown that happened in 2011. Um, what happened was a 9.0 earthquake occurred off the coast of Japan and it caused a massive tsunami that hit the Fukushima Daiichi power plant. And what happened was they, Japan had contingencies for a large tsunami, but not a tsunami of this size because a, a 9.0 earthquake is absolutely massive. And what happens is it, is it flooded, is it, it broke the wave barrier, it went over the wave barrier, and then flooded the, the basement, which contained all the cooling units. And that caused the reactor to melt down. As a result, the U.S. sent a uh, nuclear incident response team in a gesture of goodwill to Japan, and they produced this survey over here. What you see over here, these blue lines, these are flight lines. A helicopter that had a um, sodium iodide gamma ray detector was strapped to the bottom of this helicopter, and they just big, threw a big grid. So these blue lines are where you have nominal amounts of radiation, and as you go to, from light blue, and then here over here is the plume. Right, the yellow and the green are, are what I'm going to refer to as radiologically hot. So I'm refer, what if I, when I say hot and cold, that's going to be how much radiation is present at that site. Um, the issue is that there had not been very good um, comprehensive background surveys done of the actual radiation of the surrounding, the nat natural background radiation of the surrounding area. And so when they took this, this new survey, they had some trouble predicting what was, what was natural background radiation and what was the, the plume from the power plant meltdown. And they were obviously able to, to get a, a good amount of, of data here, but the, the precision, the precision basically equals time. The more precise you are, the better data you have, the easier it is to be able to track how the plume is moving in real time. So I want to talk briefly about um, exposure rates. Uh, when I say background radiation, this is very nominal, small amounts of natural background radiation. It's not harmful, even though these are high energy gamma rays. It's, it's all around us all the time, and it's not harmful at all. So this is a chart showing um, what a typical person in the UK receives and kind of the portion of, of what uh, goes into a typical exp exposure dose of, of um, radiation. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this section is radon gas, which primarily comes from the ground and granite, and it's always in the air. Um, this is medical radiation. This, is, this section over here is terrestrial, and this is cosmic radiation that comes from uh, the sun and space. This is one more chart. We're not going to get real into it. I just want to point out a few things. This comes from uh, the excellent webcomic, actually, XKCD. Um, one important note is that this little box over here, with these three green dots, they represent all the radiation in this entire chart over here. So this chunk over here is a dental x-ray. This over here, this, the one box, that's the radiation dose you receive from sleeping next to somebody. We're all a little radioactive, and we kind of give that off you know, in our sleep. Well, also, also when we were awake, but in our sleep. Um, and that, that just has to do with the radionuclides in our body. A lot, of, a lot of that's potassium. Eating a banana is about twice that much. Um, that's because we don't typically eat an entire person when we sleep next to them. We <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. <laughs> this over here represents the background radiation that the average person receives in a year. And over here is a mammogram. Um, this over here is an airline flight from New York to LA. Um, <clears throat> this is a head CT scan. Um, so it's important to note that, that, that medical doses are of, of radiation are typically a lot larger than we typically receive in a day-to-day -day life. But, um, yeah, so that's 
as much as we're going to talk about that, there's, this is actually, um, this is actually a really cool chart if anyone wants to look it up. There's, it's bigger than this, but for our purposes, this is, this is kind of what I wanted to point out. Um, so where do, where do natural sources of gamma rays, where do gamma rays come from terrestrially? And that means, terrestrial means like from, from the earth and the ground, as opposed to the sky or the, the, the atmosphere. Um, <clears throat> So all gamma rays have a characteristic source. We can, every, every single gamma ray has a certain amount of energy that we can measure, and that can tell us where it f comes from. Um, they come primarily from the, the radioactive decay of potassium, uranium, and thorium um, that exists all throughout all our soils, all of our rocks. Um, if you are looking for uh, like man-made radioactive material, that's typically cesium and a little bit of thallium. But for our purposes, we're I'm going to be talking about potassium, uranium, thorium. Um, I, I talked about a little bit of radi radon gas uh, emits a, a good amount of radiation. And cosmic rays, which are from the sun, from stars, from supernovas, all that that passes through space and ends up in our atmosphere. <clears throat> so what, what is the use of an aerial gamma ray survey? This over here is a map of a small section of Australia that's superimposed onto a digital elevation model, which just means this is a this is basic topography of a certain area. <clears throat> and all these colors represent um, how hot or cold something is radiologically. So aerial gamma ray servers are useful if you want to map soils, for instance, because you can check those radionuclides and the abundance in different soils. They're useful in mineral, mineral exploration. Oftentimes, these radionuclides are associated with, with hydrothermal deposits, which are also associated with valuable ore. Um, obviously, mapping of fallout from nuclear accidents, locating lost nuclear sources, and um, snowpack mapping, mapping. And that is because water is very, very good at, um, at stopping and blocking gamma rays. And so you can, uh, you can very quickly measure and map out what areas ha are, have about some amount of snow, snow and water on top and what areas don't. Um, <clears throat> let me give you uh, an example, a fun, a, fu a fun and interesting story about using gamma ray, aerial gamma ray surveys for tracking uh, nuclear material. Um, this is the Nevada test site located in um, kind of southern Nevada. Over here is Las Vegas. If you're not, if you're not real familiar with the, ge the geography of Nevada, this is Nevada test site. Over here is this whole testing range. Area 51 is right over here. Death Valley is right over here. And what I want to talk about is Beatty, Nevada, which is right over here. Um, this is, and also, this is, this is Yucca Mountain. So Beatty was a, um, the, well, Beatty's a small town that's very close to the, nuclear tex the, the Nevada test site. And there was a, the first licensed nuclear storage facility in the, the country for uh, low and medium level radioactive waste. It was a, it's a disposal site, um, essentially. So anything that was, that was and, and the Nevada test site, for those of you who don't know, was used for nuclear testing. There was a lot of, there was bombs dropped over there. Um, there are areas, especially in this area, that are highly radioactive because they dropped bombs there. But they also um, they tested how things reacted to different exposure rates. Uh, so let's see here. This is one example of, a, of a radioactive device that was used, that was, that was, that was stored at the disposal, disposal site. What it is is a radium clock. Um, these numbers glow in the dark due to them being radioactive. <laughs> it was very cool at the time, cutting edge, but uh, it turns out it's very bad for you. <laughs> but these were all over the place. There was many such like it that were existed in, in submarines um, and, and naval ships because they glowed, which was really nice. But it wasn't just clocks. Um, there was uh, heavy machinery. There was um, farm equipment. There was um, you know, construction equipment, plywood, building materials, all stuff that, that, that was at and used at the Nevada test site. Um, even like washing machines that were used to, to wash clothes of the people that, were, that went through the, the area, or that, that were worked at the test site. So all sorts of um, fun radioactive goodies were stored at this site. And eventually somebody thought, had the great idea to think, well, this stuff is really fun goodies and I can sell it. So workers at the site 
were illegally um, selling the radioactive, the radioactively contaminated <laughs> stuff to residents of Beatty. Um, <clears throat> And the, uh, the U.S. government didn't find out, out about this in for, for some time. But in 1972, they did. And one of the ways they, they tracked where all this radioactive material was is they just flew a plane with a, radioactive, <laughs> with, a, with a detector over the site, over the town, and they mapped it and said, oh, this house has some radioactive stuff, this house has some radioactive stuff, this guy has an entire chicken coop made of radioactive <laughs> plywood. And they, they went door to door and took everybody's stuff. <laughs> this is what a aerial gamma ray typically looks like. Um, in this case, we have a helicopter. It has a detector on the bottom of it, and then it flies over a fixed distance and measures over an area. Um, the distance is recorded. The, the latitude and longitude is recorded. So you have a, a location. A location. Um, you have a height. Um, because, because gamma rays attenuate as they move through the air, and they also spread out. So the height is, is taken into account. Um, the location is a very important, obviously, because we're mapping it. Um, and it just flies in these grid lines and takes samples at, at various points. Um, this over here is the equation of, we're, we're not going to talk too much about it, but basically the exposure equals um, the potassium by weight percentage, plus the effective uranium, the parts per million of, of uranium, plus the parts per, member, per million of thorium. Um, and then obviously multiplied by a multiplier to give us the exposure rate. In this case, we're going to use microrad an hour. But you can use, well, not with this equation, but if you modify the equation, you could use any of your favorite, uh, any of your favorite units of, of radioactive dose, and there are many of them. I originally wasn't going to include this slide, this slide because people's eyes kind of glaze over when you talk about hardware. Um, but I actually thought it would be kind of nice to, instead of do that, uh, take a couple minutes to talk about it. Because I find that, I'm, I'm new to tech, so I don't know how it is here, but I tend to find that people don't really like talking about hardware and instrumentation. Um, they, they, they see these things as sort of black boxes where you put in some information and there's some Ill illegible stuff happens inside of it, no one knows how it works, and nor can we f possibly figure out how it works. But th these, th these things really aren't that complicated. Um, in this case, this is, this, is a, this is a sodium iodide detector. This is what's typically used on these surveys. Um, in this case, we have a photon of, in this case, a gamma ray, hits a cr sodium iodide crystal. This is a semiconductor. And in turn, this produces light. Um, and this is due to the photoelectric effect and, and the work function and whatnot. And those are words you might remember from high school chemistry or you might not, but that's what's happening. Basically, a beam of light hits a photocathode. The photocathode ejects an electron, and then it bounces in a photomultiplier tube, and, and a single electron causes what's called an electron avalanche. And that doesn't just sound cool. It's actually a pretty good analogy of what's happening. Um, when you have a, a physical avalanche, you have a small amount of snow gets dislodged and hits other loosely packed um, chunks of snow. You have a, basically, you have a, a, a mountain that's, that's charged, with, charged with snow, and it's under inf the influence of a gravitational field. And so a small amount of snow will dislodge other pieces of snow, causing lots and lots more snow to, to come down the mountain. And that's exactly what's happening here. You have a small one electron that hits a electrically charged area in this tube, and it acts under the influence of an electric field. And the exact, the exact same thing is happening. Basically, it's, it's hitting the tube and causing a, lot, a, bunch, a bunch of electrons to fall down, fall down the tube. They hit the anode. It causes a pulse of electricity, and then it goes into the measuring device. Um, there's, there's some other stuff that sort of happens. It's, less, it's not really critical to how the detector works. Um, but this is essentially just the, enti the entire thing. It's really, it's really not terribly complicated, in my opinion. And, and you know, it's certainly possible for, for anybody in the room in an afternoon to get a fairly sophisticated understanding of how these things work. Um, and I think, I think they're kind of cool. 
this is this is very similar to how a uh, a Geiger counter works. A Geiger counter actually uses a, a gas-filled tube as a detector instead of a crystal, but it's it's very very similar. Um, this is the gamma ray spectrum that is useful for this instance. Um, this is our in terms of energy of the photon. Um, every sing when when there is nuclear decay um, happens, um, typically you have a an atom breaking into smaller atoms, or sometimes it ejects a, a proton, sometimes it ejects an alpha particle, which is two protons and two neutrons. Um, and these ha things happen at for a given element, they happen at fixed energies. In the case of a gamma ray, um, what happens is you have the nucleus eject a photon of very high energy. Um, it basically, it, it ejects a very high energy photon. And those, only, those are not random. Those only happen at very, very specific amounts of energy. And because every single photon that's emitted from every single uranium-255 is the same energy, we can plot that. We can put them on a spectrum and we get these peaks. So these are peaks of energy that, that occur that are based on those photons. For potassium, it's very large and it's very narrow because potassium only has a single decay. Whereas uranium and thorium, they have a decay chain. And this, these, these represent not just the original, um, the original decay, but, the, but the whole, all, all of the daughter products of that original decay. But we can see where they are is really the important thing this, from this slide. Okay, um, why study sand dunes? So all these, the, all the, the potassium, uranium, thorium, basically they come from <coughs> volcanic sources, igneous sources. So those are um, either underground magma chambers that cool or those are volcanoes. The, the way, well, actually this is probably in the wrong order. So. Let me talk briefly of, of the weathering cycle. What you have is you have a, some amount of, of magma that comes up from volcanoes or uh, volcanic magma chambers that cool. They become uplifted. And stuff just happens. The way, the way stuff erodes is it, um, stuff basically, it goes from high spots to low spots. The top of mountains erode and valley floors accumulate. So you will have a volcano. It comes out of the ground, it comes up high, and over time, that volcano is weathered down and down and down and down. That material is transported through either wind or rivers, and it makes its way other places. And at, over time, these things become less and less like the source and become more and more like sand. And they produce sand, and all the, the, uh, the more volatile minerals, the, um, the, more, the, the things that are, that are more prone to being dissolved are. And sand becomes more, and sand is very uniform, and sand is very um, chemically inert. It's made of quartz. And basically, sand, sand is less complicated, and there's less stuff inside of it than, than um, igneous rocks. This is just another photo. Uh, you can just see things go from, from high to low. This is sand on the bottom, loose sand, and this is a rock on top. So the Nebraska Sandhills are the largest dune field in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, they are about the third, a third of Nebraska is the Nebraska dune fields. They're the largest, basically, native prairie that we have in the U.S. at this point, and probably ever will. Um, they're stabilized by vegetation. They don't move. They're not roaming dunes like in the Sahara. They stay put. They've been stable for thousands and thousands of years since the last ice age. Um, and the important thing is you have these kind of drier dune crests and uh, sort of wetter dune inner dunes. Um, these over here, these are lakes. You get wetlands that occur in there. You get, um, sometimes they, they dam. And you have uh, some streams. Some of, them are, some of them are ephemeral, which means they only occur in the, more, the, the, the rainier times. And some of them are permanent. But they work the same way that anything does, where stuff moves from high to low. You have, um, you have your, your larger particles, your big grain sands that kind of stay on top, and then like the clays and the finer particles will move downhill over time. This is a 
image of Nebraska sandhills. So this is, this is Nebraska, basically, this whole thing. And this little fish-shaped object, that is Nebraska sandhills. Um, it's big. It's real big. This is a chart of the... This is, this is, um, this is a radiological chart that was based on the, the National Uranium Resource Evaluation Survey, which was a, uh, a large-scale aerial gamma ray survey that was done in um, 1973... Yeah, 1973, it was done over the entire continental United States, and its purpose was to find uranium for the Cold War. Um, it was not done, well, it was not done for any other purpose, basically. A uh, couple things of note, see this little fish-shaped object in the middle of Nebraska? Um, that is the Nebraska Sandhills. You can see that it's much colder than the surrounding area. Um, another kind of interesting area is right over here. This is the Navajo sandstone formation slash Aztec sandstone formation. Th those, th those are the same thing if you ever hear the terms. Um, that was just a very large uh, fossilized dune field. Actually, the, large, the largest in world history was the, was the Navajo sandstone formation from the Jurassic. So, um, I don't know how well you can see, but these lines over here, these are the grid lines where the player plane actually flew over. Um, all this stuff was done using ArcGIS, which is a spatial, um, a, a, a spatial analyzer, or spatial analysis program. It basically lets you combine geographic data with um, other data. <laughs> so we're just going to blow through these slides real quick because I just want you guys to get a little sense of uh, what this process actually looked like. So this was a plot, uh, so this is plot, basically, kind of, this map is overlaid. This is a, uh, a, a soil survey, a soils map that was done from the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the University of Nebraska. Uh, remember that Nebraska is farmland, so they actually are fairly interested in soils. So there is actually a really, really good data set for the soils that are mapped um, all over Nebraska, and a lot of the country, but Nebraska is pretty good in particular. So this is a, our plots of the sand content. Basically, I wanted to see if, if, if as you moved from areas of higher sand to lower sand, you would get a change in the amount of radionuclides. Um, these things are mobile to semi-mobile. Potassium is, is particularly mobile um, as long as it's not too locked into some other crystal structure. Uranium and thorium are le much less mobile, but they're pretty mobile in some conditions, conditions such as when you have very low oxygen, uranium actually dissolves very, very easily in water. Um, you can kind of see a trend as you go to, um, as you move, if you move from left to right, uh, this, is, this is the amount of sand content. You go from, from almost no sand to a lot of sand in the soil. This is basically the clay content. You can kind of see that there's sort of a trend as you get more clay, you get higher exposure rates and, and more nuclear, nu ra more of the radionucleides. Um, this is surface texture. Um, that's not so interesting to us. Depth to water table. The idea being the more <coughs> access you have to water, the more mobile these radionuclides are going to be. Uh, this is dune type, which is uh, basically kind of the shape and structure of the dune. Um, the important thing to note is that this is, these are all relatively flat. There's not really there's not really much difference between any of them. And these lines, those are the standard deviations. So in comparison with the data, there's actually, um, it doesn't really show much of anything. So this is really probably the best plot that I was able to produce. And this shows that the av this is the average exposure rate um, based on how much clay is in the soil. You can see there's a very rough positive upward trend, but there's a lot of noise, a lot, a lot, a lot of noise. Um, one other thing that I wanted to do was to uh, see if there any kind of curiosity to the data. Um, the, the, the dunes are primarily, uh, they go east-west, and so the idea is that as you move over the sand dune, you expect more at the bottom and less at the top. And I wanted to see if that turned out to be the case. So this is the, the plot of the exposure. And if you look real hard and you squint, you can kind of see that, well, maybe there are some sine waves there. Uh, but it's pretty rough stuff. And so uh, what I did was I applied a technique called the Fourier transform. 
Um, this is a, a bit of, this is based on the idea that any kind of repeating cycle that you see in nature that you can plot on a thing, any, anything that has any kind of repeating pattern whatsoever can be modeled as a series of sine waves. And for all intents and purposes, this is a little mathematical magic trick. But it's really, really kind of cool, really kind of useful. And, I, and if you've seen how these things work, I kind of want to explain briefly what it's, it, it, it looks like. What you have is you have this sort of pattern. This is not purely one sine wave. This is a combination of sine waves to produce this pattern. So what you do is you start with a, some kind of repeating pattern. right? You break it down into the individual sine waves. Uh, and then you just stack all those. You stack them from, from left to right. Just you sort them based on the amount of the amplitude. And then you just plot them from left to right. And that's what these things look like. Some of you might have seen these plots and thought that they were kind of mysterious. But that's all that is. Um, and another way it's described is, is given a milkshake, it'll tell you the, the, thing, the, the ingredients of the milkshake, is what, is what a Fourier transform does. And this didn't, really didn't work too well. Um, it really gave me kind of nothing of any value. You can see there's that big line, and that's plotted at frequency of zero, which means that there's nothing here to see, basically. And there's probably some various things that I did kind of incorrect. Well, there's a lot of things that went wrong here. But um, what it did was force me to kind of think more deeply about the data itself. Um, the way these, uh, these servers are, are kind of thought of is it's when, when you plot them on the map, they're little dots because you have a latent longitude. So there is a, a, a dot, a point on the, on the map, and it has zero area. It's just a point on a map when you actually look at it because that's just how it's displayed. But what's happening is it's, it's more like a spotlight that this detector is showing on the ground. And in fact, it's not even just a uniform spotlight. The amount that it's sampling varies based on how far you are from the center. So it's actually fairly complicated what's actually happening. And it depends on, on what you're actually looking at, whether that matters or not. So this is actually, instead of a series of dots, this is actually what the, sam what the detector is reading. right? you have these inner circles and you have increasingly wider circles. It's sampling less and less from the wider circles than from the inner circles. And that's important if you're going to go fly over um, points on a map. If you're, if you're using these, these, um, these very narrow boundaries of soil types, um, if you, and if you have points that are comparable to the actual size of these sand dunes, it's really going to be very difficult to sample something in a way that's meaningful because you're sampling way over the boundaries that you think you are. This is just another little plot of a different flight line. So uh, in conclusion, you can see a very rough um, correlation between the amount of clay content and based on soil type and the exposure rate. And that was found. And you guys kind of saw a little bit about that. Um, but that was the best plot that I was able to pr produce with this data. And as you kind of saw, this stuff was very widely spaced apart, and it was done sort of, they weren't terribly interested in Nebraska sandhills because they didn't have any uranium because it was very cold and very uniform. So they, in other parts of the country, they had a very much more narrow flight length. They slowed the plane down. You had better data. And this was also done in 1973 um, with an airplane. So there, it's possible to get much better survey data. In fact, there's much better, there, Australia for instance, has a very, very good national uh, radiological survey, but it just wasn't done in this case. And it's important to think about the, the geometry and sort of how this data, this data is actually um, harvested and what the, data, what the data you're actually looking at is when you're trying to think about what is it, how meaningful is this and what, what is it that I'm actually looking at. All right, thank you very much.